Welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Worldwide Willis. And this podcast is presented to you by the LMG Podcast Network. Welcome back, folks. Welcome to another beautiful day to speak about pro wrestling. It's always a beautiful day, right? Today on the docket, we are going to touch on, our, of course, our matches of the week. We're going to touch on some factions. Uh, this, and I guess factions is the theme of the episode today. If you know me, you know I love a good faction. I love a good faction. I'm kind of old school, right? Back in the day, it was factions everywhere. That's just the way it was. Um, and then Vince McMahon's not really a fan of it, so he kind of cut it out of the WWE product. So factions started to become a little more rare. You rarely see them, really never. Um, so for me, I come from the WCW, you know, old school, Four Horsemen, NWO, you know, even during that time, WWE, DX, uh, Ministry of uh, Darkness and Corporation, all these other places, right? Nation of Domination, all these places. And so I've always loved when a group of wrestlers get together and try to dominate or try, try to accomplish a goal, right? Because I just think that's that's more realistic than 87 wrestlers all on their own individually trying to win everything on their own right or have success on their own that doesn't make sense and no uh area of life would if you're at school right and there's people sitting at the lunch tables and there's people getting in fights i don't know about y'all but i'm gonna see i'm gonna look across and be like yo you are you trying to run with me like you know what i'm saying like we're gonna tag up we're gonna get together and then we're gonna get busy you know and that's naturally what would happen in any other arena so why not in pro wrestling if i'm trying to win the championship why wouldn't i group up with a group of people and form a team and then we can do our best to help each other out to try to win championships like that's normal right and so this episode is going to mainly talk about the success of factions the history of factions the greatest factions there's ever been right we're going to touch on all of it and so I'm really excited for this one. So first of all, uh, to segue into current factions, um, I really like the w the WWE product is amazing right now. Um, for those that aren't tapped in every week, I, I understand there was a, there's some lulls. I get it. Um, you got to take a break sometime. But I will say, if you're going to get back into wrestling, if you had an inkling, if maybe this podcast, hopefully made you interested in getting back into wrestling on a day-to-day or maybe like week-to-week check out, you know, pay-per-views every t- every month or whatever, that's fine too. I hope this podcast can do that for you. But I will say, if there's a time to jump back in, right now is a very good time. We're going through a very, a, a, a renaissance, uh, lack of a better word, a renaissance of the factions. Um, we are seeing factions have a lot of major success uh, in WWE right now, and we're seeing beautiful storytelling. We're seeing factions interweave into each other, right? We're seeing uh, the Judgment Day having beef with somebody, and then Imperium having beef with that same uh, good guy. And so Bloodline and, and Imperium, both bad guy factions, are like, all right, bro, you help me out, I'll help you out. But you're seeing Imperium and the Bloodline, who both have beef with Sami Zayn uh, and Kevin Owens, and they work a little deal on the side, you know, a little under the table deal. Hey, you handle this for me, I'll handle that for you. That's natural. Like, that's good. That's so many stories can come from that stuff, right? And that's what I like to see. Every It used to be when Vince was writing the show, I swear, it felt like it felt like backstage, none of these people talked to each other. It felt like, you know, there was a storyline, them people... The two people involved in that storyline did not speak to anyone else in the locker room, did not interact with anyone else in the locker room. No storylines ever inter like interwoven. Like they never encountered anyone else. It did. It never made sense. Right. Like if I'm in a locker room, I have beef with somebody. We're probably if we're beefing for long enough, we're going to interact with some other people. Right. Some more people may jump into the beef. More people may get involved. Right. And so I love right now that Triple H 
is understanding the realism of it. Like if I'm a group, if I'm a bad guy and I don't like this good guy and there's another bad guy across the way who also doesn't like that good guy. Hey, I'm going to be like, yo, yo, let's help each other out. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, uh, I feel like that's happening right now. And we're seeing a lot of that. Um, so some of the factions um, currently going on right now, obviously the bloodline, possibly the goat. We'll talk about that later, but they're having probably the best run of any faction ever um, with Roman Reigns, the Usos, that whole dynamic. Uh, we're kind of past the whole Sami Zayn thing, but that was obviously one of the greatest stories we've had in years. So like the bloodline, obviously they're the, they're the linchpin. They're the goal of every other faction to reach. Right. Next we have Imperium who's led by Gunther and he is um, the leader of the group. Uh, Imperium is a great faction going back years, way back in NXT, they've killed it. Um, and we have the judgment day. We have Damian priest. Who's been on a roll. Dude has been putting on smack, like, outstanding matches week after week after week after week honestly if there's a improved wrestler if there's a improved player of the year for wrestling it should be damian priest like dude has hit every mark in the last year um dude is killing it so judgment day you got damian priest you got finn balor you got dominique mysterio and you have the best women women's wrestler right now uh rhea ripley and yes, I said she's the best. I believe she's the best. Um, I love Bianca. Me, her and Bianca are right up there with each other. And then you have the LWO. Um, and that is a mixture of uh, Santos Escobar um, and Rey Mysterio and uh, other team, other members, uh, Zelina Vega, things of that nature. They're doing really well. Uh, really, I want to see Santos Escobar kind of take it in a more old school Eddie route where he, the LWO becomes more of a, a heel faction, but I'm cool with it starting as a, as a good faction. I get it. Got to sell merchandise, you know, and they're killing it merch wise. Like a lot of people are buying, as I mentioned before, uh, in a previous episode, a lot of people are buying LWO shirts, which is beautiful. Love to see it. Um, Damage control, which is a women's faction, which we have not had many women's factions. Um, we haven't had many in a while. Uh, but Damage Control, who's who's had some moments, who's also had some down moments, but Becky, uh, Dakota Kai, and EO Sky. Um, and then we have other members, like a faction I really like in uh, NXT is Chase U. Um, Chase U is a really funny um, group. They're, they're hilarious to me. And, um, yeah, I think you should just check them out. They're a really cool up-and-coming uh, faction that I think – if they were ever brought to the main roster, we'd get over really fast. They're just fun. Um, they basically act like they're, they are at a university. <laughs> and so it's, it's funny. So uh, you have to check it out. But the main point of all that and laying out those groups is just letting you know that like factions are deep. There's many, there's other factions than the ones I just named, right? Like there's plenty, the Delgado, uh, D'Angelo family and, and things of that nature. So Gallus and things. So, I think what we're seeing is a renaissance of the faction. There's no reason why a bunch of dudes and a bunch of women should be just going about this individually, right? You should have groups. You should have just like gangs are put together. This is the same, same uh, result, right? Uh, same thought behind this. So I'm really happy with what we're seeing in the factions right now. Um, I'm super excited to see how they develop, who falls out of factions, because that's the great thing about factions they're they're a engine for storytelling right on uh, just by themselves if you have a faction probably at some point just like evolution for example that was a faction that was triple h rick flair batista and randy orton at the end of the day uh eventually uh, i think was it batista the first one to get turned on and batista got kicked out then randy or randy orton got kicked out right like it's a eventually somebody's they're going to start having inner beef within that faction. And then that's a whole nother, you know, time to have storyline. So it's a vehicle for stories all day long. So that's why I really love it. Um, and it's just like, you know, repping your, repping your, repping your crew, you know, and uh, it's always fun to see um, when NWO will walk out 
like NWO, NWO had a lot of problems, but when they walked out with that uh, white and black NWO shirt, like they looked cool, like they looked cool as hell. So uh, factions are a, a dominant weapon. All right, next we will talk about uh, the upcoming Money in the Bank field. Uh, we're seeing, we're almost done with the women's field. I think they have to have one more person to qualify. There'll be six competitors in both the men's and the women's uh, Money in the Bank matches. So for the men, I will say, they've done a really good job of booking these matches. So there, it used to be Money in the Bank would be like, you know, maybe out of the, I think it used to be eight competitors, but I could be wrong. Let's say it's six. Out of six, you'd probably have four good wrestlers and then two just wild cards. One was maybe one was maybe there for just comedic purposes. Another was there, you know, maybe they're big. Can't you don't really see them ever like winning, but they just can can, you know, be a added element to the match and whatever. Where in this one, this year, hey, they didn't miss. So in the men's match, you got Ricochet who's perfect, perfect for a Money in the Bank match. Like, you can just think of all the spots he's going to do. Uh, Damian Priest, as I talked about, dude is going to roll. Shinsuke Nakamura, who's come back in a really big way and kind of kind of leaning more back to his original debut, sort of his uh, NXT original debut to the main roster days uh, when he beat John Cena and things of that nature. Shinsuke is looking good. You got Butch, who I hope they move him back to Pete Dunne. So Butch is his name now, and he's part of – that's another uh, faction. Um, the uh, Brawling Brutes with Seamus um, – I forgot my guy's name – and then Butch and uh, Ridge the Fridge. Yeah, I forgot my dude's name, but Ridge Holland. And I hope they move Butch's name – they changed his name for some reason, but I hope they move him back to his original name, was which was Pete Dunn. Pete Dunn is just – Pete Dunn could challenge anybody for any title, and you'd feel you'd respect him. But that's how good he was back in the day. So you got Butch, you got Santos Escobar, who I think is a great entrance to this, and uh and is just a great wrestler and has plenty of experience in money in the bank style matches and ladder matches in general. Um, and then finally, you have LA Knight. Yeah. Yeah, so LA Knight is in there. I hope LA Knight wins. I'm his biggest fan, uh, truly. I think the dude is money on the microphone. He's out, like, just the thought of thinking him walking out every week with the money in the bank briefcase, talking crap to everybody, is just be hilarious, right? Him, like, you know, trying to scare other wrestlers, like, with, like, false cash-ins and things of that nature. Like, it'd be really good. So I'm hoping LA Knight wins. But overall, that's just a great field. So you, so everybody in that field, Ricochet, Damian Priest, Shinsuke, Butch, Santos Escobar, and LA Knight, like, like all those guys are really good wrestlers. So, <clears throat> and all of them have some personality. So it's not going to be boring, but it is going to be a really good match. Sometimes they've uh, prioritized comedy or, you know, elements like that into the match. When this one, I think, going to do the job itself. It doesn't need all the extra stuff. L.A. Knight alone is charismatic enough to kind of make up for that. Uh, in the women's match, we have Becky, um, Becky Lynch. We have Bailey. We have E.O. Sky. Uh, we have Zelina Vega. And then we have Zoe Stark. Again, all really good wrestlers. Uh, Zelina is a good. Zelina's good. Um, but overall, pretty good. Now, they are. we are missing one. I think one more woman has to qualify. Because uh, we only have five entrants right now, so we'll see who that fit, that sixth entrance is, uh, and see who that person is. But you know, overall, really good field. I am interested. Bailey and EO, as I mentioned before, are part of Damage Control, so Bailey and EO are in the same faction. So, and they've been having like some like tension lately, right? They've been having some. Bailey's kind of been hating on EO because EO's kind of been like, yo, I kind of want to do my own thing. You know what I mean? I I, I like the tag team with uh, Dakota Kai, but I also know I'm EO Scott. I'm, I was an NXT Women's Champion for a while. Like, I'm a real one. I can hang with the best of them. Uh, she had a great match with uh, Bianca. I had a great match with Becky Lynch. Like, you know, so I think EO should go on her own. And I've talked about that before in other episodes. 
So Bailey and EO being in the same faction in a money in the bank match is going to be interesting. I think that is the point where they're going to have uh, either Bailey turn on EO or something of that nature. Right. I think that dynamic, something's going to change in this match. Uh, it just has to, you, you have to address two people being in the same faction going for the money in the bank. Right. Uh, but I'm really excited for that match. Should be a good one. Now I did want to talk about um, what I'm seeing from. So Sammy, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens obviously won the tag team unified tag team uh, championships at WrestleMania night one against the Usos. And so far they've been doing really their championship run as a tag team. has been fun. Like I was a little scared. It would get a little stale the further they, they got away from the bloodline storyline, but it hasn't. It has been really fun. And I think the reason for that is less of Sammy and more credit to Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens has been hilarious, bro. The last like three, four weeks, Kevin Owens is basically his character. And it's kind of always been this way. It's basically like, he's kind of like the person, he's kind of like our avatar. He's always kind of been that way. Like the way he wrestles, the way he looks, like you're like, oh man, he looks like a regular guy who can just really wrestle really well. He's not the biggest dude. He's not the most buff guy, but he just looks like a regular guy who can go out there and be the, you know, most talented wrestler out there. And but the great thing about Kevin Owens is his personality. He even I remember Imperium. So he so we all know how wrestling works, right? Uh, let's say somebody comes out there, they're doing a promo, they're talking on the mic, and they say somebody's name. Okay, once they say somebody's name, that person they said their music hits, boom, they come out and walk out. That's just the way it always happens, right? We don't know why. That's just wrestling, <laughs> that's just how it always goes. But it, this, I think this week, or no, it was the week before, um, Kevin Owens and Sammy were talking, and they're just talking about, you know, people, you know, challenging them for the tag team titles. And Imperium walks out before their names are said or anything. And Kevin Owens goes, wait a minute, like, that's not how this works. Like, you don't understand how this works. And he get, he's getting, like, pissed, and it's hilarious to watch. But he's like, how it works is I say your name, then you walk out. You don't just walk out. You don't just come out whenever you want. You have to be, someone has to address you. Then you come out. It was just funny because it's like, okay, like we're addressing uh, a wrestling trope that no one really talks about. And it's kind of silly, but you know, like if I got a problem with somebody in real life, I'm not going to wait for them to introduce me, right? <laughs> like I'm just going to come out there and, and address them. But in wrestling, like that's just the way it has always been. So for Kevin, these last couple of weeks, he's just kind of been ripping the, He's kind of been low-key breaking the fourth wall and just being, like, really realistic about everything. Like, anybody addresses him, he, like, gets super – he's about to blow a, blow a gasket, as they've been saying. Uh, he's been getting pissed. And anytime Kevin Owens gets pissed and gets, like, really worked up, it's hilarious because he always is really funny. Uh, so I would suggest everybody – I think all the clips of him being – of the things I've talked about and things other ones – uh, our been on Instagram and on YouTube. Uh, shout out to WWE. They did a really good job, way better than AEW, of like cutting their clips to where if you're a wrestling fan and you don't necessarily have time to watch every episode every week, you can go to YouTube and watch three, four minute clips. And you're caught up. You're good to go. You know what I mean? So they have that for Kevin Owens. And so I would suggest really checking it out. Like he's made their run as tag team champions way more interesting because he's just funny. Like he's obviously one of the most talented wrestlers out there, right? You like, honestly, Kevin Owens low key, like the, the Nikola Jokic of wrestling. He doesn't look the part, but just naturally dude is as talented as anybody in the league. Right. And that's kind of how it is. Like Kevin Owens can do every move you would ask from a, if you, Kevin Owens can do a lot of the stuff Ricochet can do, but Kevin Owens can also do a lot of stuff Gunther can do. You know what I mean? That's how his his talent ranges from. He can do backflips, somersaults, uh, swanton bombs, uh, but he can do power bombs, the stunner, you know, all these other things. Um, so brain busters, all these things. So Kevin Owens, he's like the Jokic of of, uh, of wrestling. So I'm really shout out to him. I'm glad he's getting more shine. He had to take kind of a backseat during the bloodline storyline a little bit and let Sammy shine, which he should have respecting him, but now I think Kevin's kind of stepping ahead and doing his thing. Now, lastly, for the current stuff, then we'll get into the 
top five factions. But currently, I'm really excited that Bianca Belair is sort of starting to turn heel. So um, for those that don't know, Bianca Belair, when she was in NXT, she was in NXT for a while. Right. I thought she would be called. I thought she'd be one of those where she's in NXT for maybe a year or two. They see her talent and they're like, nah, you got to, you got to, what you're doing here, you got to do that in the main roster. Like, we need you. But they let her cook down there on the NXT for, for a while. And so, and she didn't move up till, I think, 2020, I think. And so, <clears throat> uh, right in NXT, Bianca Belair was a heel, technically. I don't necessarily, she wasn't like a, a, uh, like a big time heel. She wasn't like going over the top, but she was a heel. She wasn't out there to like right now, Bianca Belair, the last couple of years in WWE has kind of been like the, as, as I've talked about, she's kind of the, the John Cena, the, the, when Bailey first came out, she was like the positive Bailey. That's kind of what Bianca's been. She's kind of been the positive, honorable, you know, don't say nothing too crazy back to you, but just be an honorable champion. Where in NXT, Bianca was, like, talking crazy to people. Like, she was giving you all the attitudes. She was giving you everything, all the spice, all that stuff. And she was funny as hell. That's what I loved about NXT, Bianca, because she was funny. Like, she – and she represented what a black woman – like, the way a black woman would speak in wrestling, that's what she did in NXT. She does a little bit in the main roster now. But I'm happy to see her – since she lost to uh, Asuka um, – in Night of Champions, she lost the title to Asuka. She slowly started to turn, and we're, I'm loving to see it. Like, it's just, I think sometimes, and we know this, like, some wrestlers are, they feel like they're in a box when they're a, a babyface, right? You can't, there's certain things you can't do when you're a babyface. And it's not, I'm not necessarily talking about, like, cheating or low blows. I'm talking about just your attitude, the way you carry yourself, your promos, only certain baby faces can get away with stuff. Stone Cold, The Rock. There's not many baby faces can just talk crazy to people and still be beloved and still be beloved by kids. And so Bianca, I feel like, was in sort of a box when she was a, a baby face. She could she could only say certain things, could only address certain things where Bianca, the heel, can just go at people. Right. Pull up, say whatever she wants talk crazy to whoever she wants. Um, and I'm excited for that. I think Bianca is hated on way too much. Like some people, a lot of people think she's overrated, which is crazy, crazy to say. The woman has had five-star matches after five-star match after five-star match. So to, to think she's overrated is wild. But I can understand if you're a little worn out with babyface Bianca, especially if you've been exposed to heal Bianca in NXT. You know how talented she is there. You know how much freedom she had there and how you know how she used that freedom to benefit her herself. I think <clears throat> excuse me, I think that once she gets to the main roster, I mean once she turns heel, I think you'll see everything. Everything will kind of come together. Right? It's sort of like it's not necessarily the same cuz I mean <clears throat> Bianca as a babyface was over. Like people loved her. Like, let's not, I don't, want, I don't want to compare it that way. But I do think a good example of someone who's a baby face and kind of feels in a box and then they turn heel and then everything comes together for them, Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns, when he was a, when he was a baby face, it, it was always felt real like generic. It felt like generic cereal, right? Uh, great value cereal. Never felt like I got anything extra from it. He turns heel, now I got everything. He's, he's, he's free, he says whatever he wants. He, he, everything comes out of his mouth feels extremely natural. And that's what I'm hoping will happen for Bianca when she turns heel. Because I think that's naturally who she is. She naturally likes, you know, like spitting, like really going at people, which I like. So I'm really excited for Bianca to turn heel. I think heel Bianca is just, that's money. She's money either way, but heel Bianca, man. Like she could, she could take it to a whole another level that we didn't even know about. So now to finish it off, we're going to talk about our, my personal top five best factions. Now, when I say my personal, I feel like a lot of people go, well, it's my top five. 
you can have your own top five. It's my personal top five, and you can't say anything bad about it. No, I want all the smoke. I want all the smoke. When I have a top five, I am saying this top five as if this is the official top five for everyone else. I know that's not how this works. However, that's how I go about ranking things, right? I'm a competitive person, so, hey, I want all the smoke. If you if you disagree with my top five, I respect it. Let me know. You can let me know in uh, our Twitter, uh, at the LMG Podcast on Twitter, or on our Facebook group. Join the Facebook group if you aren't on it. If you are, hit me up. What's your thoughts? So, my top five best factions. I will have a honorable mention section as well. Um, but number five, one of my favorite factions of all time. And honestly, one of the first factions that like really exposed me to like history and like how big they were. Number five, got to be the four horsemen. Hold up your fours. For all those people out there, hold up your fours for a little bit. Let's take a moment. Let's take a moment. Um, Four horsemen. One of the greatest factions of all time. We all know that, led by Ric Flair. And uh they were they changed the game, bro. Like there wasn't they kind of gave people permission to be a heel faction, right? Usually heels for the most part was like a group of really good guys. There was a few other bad guys, uh heels out there, uh, heel factions out there, but the four horsemen took it to another level. Uh, they took it to a different level everywhere. And that's back in the territory days, right? That's where there wasn't just the WWE, right? Back then it was, you know, NWA, the Memphis territory, the Portland territory, the, you know, <clears throat> the Florida territory. You know, there were so many different territories, the Texas territory. And the four horsemen traveled to each and every one of them and pissed all, all the fans off from every different territory, right? Um, so the four horsemen originally was Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, the enforcer, Ole Anderson, and Tully Blanchard. Tully Blanchard is extremely underrated. And the four horsemen, I mean, if you don't, if you don't like old school re- wrestling, you might not, you know, you don't mess with the four horsemen. But I do. Like my favorite wrestler right now is the Ring General Gunther. Why? Because he's old school. He's he's there to beat your ass. He's not there to do all these other flips. That's fun. I like to see it. But I come to see people fight and get and get active. You know what I'm saying? And that's what the four horsemen did. And they introduced uh some real side like low blows and, and like cheating ways to win. And they did it and they were they were unapologetic about it. Like they was all that was the first time I'd seen a faction <clears throat> where every member's holding a belt. Every member got some gold around their waist or over their shoulder. I always thought that was dope. Like, to me, if you're a faction, if you're a true leader of a faction, just like Roman Reigns is now you know, and had a long time as, to me, you should be the champ if you're the leader of the faction. And then your, your boys with you should have belts with them, whether that's tag team belts or singles belts. So, like, to me, the Four Horsemen, and, bro, not even t- I didn't even mention their their theme music bro just go youtube their theme music if i, I swear when them when them hooves start you start hearing the, the horses running and then that horse uh yells and then that music hit hey bro i don't know who did their who did their drums and who did their the guitar on that bro they 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 put in work they deserve a max contract because that i, I honestly <clears throat> before this podcast, before I started recording, I was listening to, I was like, you know what? Let me go listen to it again. I haven't, listened, I haven't heard the Four Horsemen theme in a minute. I thought, you know, three minutes, in and out, cool. Do my little research, keep it moving. Bro, I spent an hour and a half watching <laughs> uh, Four Horsemen YouTube videos. Like, just went down a whole rabbit hole and just, did I, and I didn't even know it. Like, I looked up and I was like, oh, damn. Like, that's how fun the Four Horsemen, remembering them and 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 researching and thinking about like the, even the WCW days when they, the four horsemen uh, came back and they added Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko um, and others. Uh, and they kind of revamped it. And there's been plenty of other members of the four horsemen, right? They have revamped it a few times, but when I think of the four horsemen, I think of Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson and Tully, Bryant, Tully Blanchard and God, just go YouTube four horsemen theme. 
it feels like you're in a, a 80s action movie theme. That's how that's the vibe it gets. And like it just I don't know, man. It just gives me nostalgia hearing it because it gives me like that old school wrestling, like we're old white dudes, buff white dudes with long hair. And, it, you know, it's just old school. And it was just it was just cool to watch. So uh, number five, out of, out of just respect alone, I, I think you can't have a top five best factions and not have the four horsemen in there. Just out of just they created a lot of this stuff that all these other factions are doing, um, especially heel work. And to be fair, Four Horsemen, even when they were heel or they were babyface, they were they were popular. You know what I mean? So, and we all know Ric Flair, like one of the most popular wrestlers of all time. Okay, so number four, I'm going with DX, D Generation X, um, led by. So, okay, let me let me give you some context here. I am not the biggest DX fan. I am not. I I honestly missed. The early parts of DX, I, I don't want to say I missed it. I just wasn't as interested because I thought it was like a great value NWO. But <clears throat> my favorite version of D Degen- Generation X is when Shawn Michaels was gone. When Sh- when Triple H took over the mantle as the leader, Triple H, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. When Triple H took over as the leader, added X Pac, added Billy Gunn, added Road Dog. Still had China there. That's the DX to me that took it to another level, right? A lot of people just think Shawn Michaels, which was cool. I get it. He's one of the goats. I get it. And even their second run in like the mid 2000s, that was fun. Cool, whatever. But when I have them on this list, I'm talking about with Triple H, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, X Pac, China. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I think that group alone um, killed it. And this is what I mean. When you have a faction, to me, the blueprint, the blueprint of a faction, if you're putting one together, is your leader needs to be a top guy. Your leader needs to be a championship contender level wrestler every week. It don't matter if he has the belt or not. You think of him as a championship level contender. Now, after that, you, you need to have an elite tag team. You have to have an elite tag team who can go out there and and represent your faction in the tag team division, right? Just like the horsemen, you had Ole Anderson, Arn Anderson. Um, In the bloodline, you have the Usos, right? Um, In Evolution, I think it was Ric Flair and Randy Orton. Not the the most seamless tag team, but they won tag team championships, right? Um, So to me, you got to have that elite tag team in your faction to really to really make a, a imprint like you want to, uh, for example, NWO, the Outsiders, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, you got to have an elite tag team. Then you got to have, you know, a big time talker, which we know, obviously, um, Triple H is great on the mic. But Road Dog, we know Road Dog is nice on the mic. Um, I still can never remember his whole spiel, but uh, I know someone out there who, now that I've said Road Dog. They're about they're going through in their mind that his whole spiel. So shout out to you uh, for knowing that. But yeah, DX, that gener- that era of DX, I think was the golden era of DX. I think it was funny, but then they also killed it in the ring. You know what I mean? It wasn't just silly spots all the time. So number four, DX. Now, number three. Now, this one is a uh, some people may know this if you're a deep cut wrestling fan. If you're not, uh, bear with me. You may be learning something. This may be a teaching moment. Now, number three, <laughs> excuse me, number three is the Bullet Club. Now, some would say, why so high? I believe the Bullet Club changed wrestling in the mid 2010s, early 2010s. Now, it originally started with Finn Balor as the leader. Finn Balor, Young Bucks, uh, a few other guys. And, bro, they changed the game. They they literally it, just think of a group that was heavily influenced by NWO, heavily, heavily end up, uh, influenced by NWO, very, like, grungy, very, like, hip. Um, honestly, just a bunch, of, a bunch of white dudes they've added. They've obviously become way more diverse. But at the beginning, you know, a bunch of white guys, maybe a few Polynesian, maybe a few Samoans or whatever. It started in New Japan Wrestling. 
So if you're thinking like, what? Oh, I don't know these people if I just watch WWE. This is why. They started in New Japan wrestling. And New Japan, honestly, in the early 2010s, um, was like the golden age of wrestling, honestly. Especially because WWE during that time was awful. It was trash. Um, and so a lot of the best wrestlers weren't even in WWE. They were in New Japan, like Finn Balor. Um, and so it started with Finn Balor as the leader. And then you had the Young Books, one of the best tag teams in the world at the time, and even still now. And then Finn Balor transitioned, went to uh, NXT, and obviously from there, you know his story. But then AJ Styles took over as the leader. AJ Styles, the AJ Styles, right? So you transitioned from a Hall of Famer in Finn Balor to an, 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 another Hall of Famer, and AJ Styles is your leader. They had uh, Kenny Omega, who's one of the greatest wrestlers ever, uh, another Hall of Famer in their group. Like, the Bullet Club is an elite crew, bro. Like, if you, I'm sure if you watch wrestling shows or have seen wrestling, you've seen somebody with a Bullet Club t-shirt. You may have not known what it was about, but trust me, it's fire. Like, even when you, when you see, like, AJ Styles and Finn Balor, like, do the NWO you know, wolf pack sign, uh, hand gesture and like too sweet type of gesture. They're meaning they're not like paying homage to NWO. They're paying. That was the, um, they took that from NWO, but that's kind of referencing the bullet club. And so, yeah, I got to go bullet club at three, just because their influence is so, so deep, man. Like they had basically, they kept turning over and evolving and adding new members. There's so many people who you wouldn't know. Cody Rose was in the Bullet Club. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many big-time wrestlers who came through the Bullet Club. And the Bullet Club is still a thing today. Uh, there's actually a Bullet Club gold in uh, NXT, I mean, in AEW right now. Um, and so I'm I, I'm really, I really like the Bullet Club. I actually have a Bullet Club t-shirt actually around here somewhere, but... Um, they're number three due to their modern influence, right? There's a lot of wrestlers we know now have been in the Bullet Club, have been influenced by the Bullet Club. So I got, I got to get put them in that top five. Now, number two, as we know, one of the coolest factions to ever be created, the NWO and New World Order, WCW days. Now, NWO. You can't go anywhere without knowing the NWO. Like, that's just, to me, that's the most known faction of all time. May not be the greatest. It was hella sloppy. Didn't have the greatest storylines. But the most popular faction of all time got to be NWO, right? If you see an NWO t-shirt, like, your mom probably knows what that's from. Auntie does. Your uncle. You know, it's just one of those. Um, So, NWO obviously started with uh scott scott hall <laughs> hulk hogan kevin nash and many different members after that obviously um scott steiner and, and things of that nature and it was i mean when it started it was fun because it was small it was smaller i'm not mad at bigger uh factions i'm not mad at that if they still do it correctly i'm not mad at this i don't really care how big it is but the fun part about it early on was like it was like, who's going to join the NWO? Like they would, the NWO would present uh, a wrestler and be like, hey, you should join the NWO. And then that that wrestler would like, you know, think about it for a minute and then decide. And so that like tension and that like suspense of like, oh man, is he going to turn into the NWO or is he not? Or, you know, for weeks they were trying to get, obviously trying to get Sting to turn to the NWO. That was an amazing storyline. It was the basically the NWO versus w, true WCW wrestlers. You had your Sting, your Lex Luger's, your things of that nature. And then that was a fun storyline. And then not to mention the Wolfpack storyline where Kevin Nash created his own NWO group where it was red and black. Uh, by the way, Wolfpack theme song, one of the greatest theme songs of all time. So was New World Order, regular theme song fire like that that guitar hit and this is is amazing but that wolf pack is that that came from hip-hop and so that that hits a little harder right you throw that in the car the made always hit um so nwo i i think nwo similar to the four horsemen 
had a huge influence. Again, I just spoke about the Bullet Club. The Bullet Club is a is a child of the NWO. Like down to the color scheme, Bullet Club is white and black. So NWO obviously was white and black. Um, so many different factions took from the NWO to make what they to do what they did. So to me, NWO just one of the coolest factions there was. There was no faction that's been as over as them, right? Like in the '90s, bro, you you couldn't go anywhere without seeing the NWO shirt. You just couldn't. Um, they were everywhere, and obviously, also, <clears throat> it started the Hollywood Hulk Hogan gimmick, right? Hulk Hogan was a good guy all the way up to that point, and then he turned heel, which was a game changer. And honestly, that's probably my that's my favorite. Well, I mean, it's hard to say my favorite Hulk Hogan. I can't even say that full sentence. But if I had to choose of the two versions, Hulk Hulkamania Hulk Hogan and Hollywood Hulk Hogan, going to go with Hollywood. And obviously, they uh, after a while, the NWO was brought over to the WWE. They did it with the WWE. It wasn't as good, but it was it was fine. You know, it had a little time. Um, you had The Rock and Stone Cold and others going up against the NWO, which is fun. Uh, we all, like, dreamed of seeing that in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was a little... You know, after we wanted to see it, but it was fine. You know, we saw it, and that, that's all that matters. Now, number one, this may shock some folks, but to some, it may not. I need you to hold up your ones. I need you to hold up your ones for the bloodline at number one. We them ones. Now, some would say, what? Like, they're not even done yet. Like, that's way too soon. Is it? Is it way too soon? They've been doing this since 2021, 2020, 2021, right? Like, and they haven't fell off since. Roman Reigns, to me, is the GOAT. He's the greatest champion we've ever had. He's a, he's just wiping wiping his feet with uh, records right now, title reign records right now. He just, every everyone you think he may not get to, he gets to it and then dominates it. So you have the greatest champion of all time in Roman Reigns. You arguably have the greatest tag team of all time in the Usos. Now, do I love the Usos? Do I think they're the most like talented tag team of all time? No. But every time I doubt the Usos or go, well, they are they that great? Every time I watch a match with them, it's amazing. Amazing. It don't matter who they're going up against. And then also, this whole bloodline storyline has brought out the acting skills of Jay and Jimmy Uso. Right, has brought it out. It's been amazing. Um, those guys literally could transition easily into movies, television, whatever, due to their performances we've seen. Same with Roman Reigns, and he's gonna do that eventually. So you have again, greatest champion of all time in Roman Reigns, possibly the greatest tag team of all time in the Usos, and then you have the greatest manager of all time, the greatest um, talking piece of all time in Paul Heyman. Um, okay, so we have Paul Heyman. Then we have a guy who, you know, he's not anywhere near the greatest of anything right now in Solo Sokoa. However, dude has a bright future. He could potentially be a world champion down the line. I have to add that into my thinking, right? If you have, like, if I'm, when I'm rating the evolution, that, that, um, faction, okay, I'll take into account Ric Flair, okay, obviously one of the GOATs. I got taken in Batista, not one of the goats, but Hall of Famer, right? Really good, really good run there um, with the heavyweight championship uh, during that time. Triple H, one of the goats. And at that time, uh, you know, obviously Randy Orton was really good, but he wasn't Randy, Randy, Randy Orton yet. But I have to take into account, okay, they had one of the highest potential wrestlers in the world at the time in their group. I have to give you bonus points for that. And I have to give you points for what he then went up to, went on to do. So that's what my thinking was solo. I'm thinking solo is going to go off and go on to do amazing things. And so <clears throat> with that, got to give him some points, got to give bloodline some points on that. And I just think <clears throat> obviously factions have been, have done amazing things before. However, I, one of the reasons I think Roman is the goat and what I think, reasons i think the bloodline is the greatest faction of all time is because they've kept it tight they haven't taken any lulls they haven't had any lulls they've taken every wrestler that's touched the bloodline 
has ended up better on the other end. I mean, perfect example, Sami Zayn. Before this, Sami Zayn was an underappreciated wrestler. He was an amazing talent, but was not appreciated to the level he needed to be. He, he gets involved with the bloodline. Okay, cool. We go through the whole thing. It spits, bloodline spits him out. And now he's one of the biggest stars uh, WWE has, right? People were literally like, he should be Roman Reigns. I don't think he should have. Uh, they made the right decision there, but they were like, he should beat Roman Reigns. Like if you all you if you need to if you question like oh, did they really make him a, a, a popular you know champion or a popular wrestler? Like go back and look at WrestleMania Night Thirty One and look at how the crowd accepted him. Go look at um, <clears throat> go look at I mean even uh, Elimination Chamber in Montreal. Go look that up that entrance up of Sami Zayn. It went crazy. Right. So, again, the bloodline, everybody they've touched has come out better every single time. You know what I mean? So I think the bloodline is the greatest faction of all time. I think they've done everything picture perfectly. They haven't added a whole bunch of members just to say they are in it. They've kept it tight. They've let everybody in the bloodline shine. Everybody has had their moment. Everybody has been able to show off their talent. And so, again, hold up your wands for the bloodline. Greatest faction of all time. Now, <clears throat> some of my honorable mentions. The Undisputed Era. Shock the System with Adam Cole, Roger Strong, um, Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish. Man, when they, bruh, like 2017, 18, even 19, Undisputed Era. <laughs> Right. That that gave me four horsemen vibes. Right. That crew Undisputed Era was amazing, bro. Amazing. I loved Undisputed Era. One of my like they had me tuning in to NXT every week over WWE. Like I was watching NXT like it was WWE. That's how good it was. And I was <laughs> extremely sad when they broke up. And the fact that they're not together still is, is a travesty. I really wish Adam Cole would have stayed with WWE. I really think he would have if he would have known that Triple H was going to take over. At the time when he left, Vince was still there, and Vince didn't like Adam Cole, thought he was too small. You know, classic Vince story. And um, I think he was – and Adam was like, all right, let me go over to AEW where I can cook. Now, he's just now starting to cook a little bit, but – I'll be honest. He's, I mean, and he has dealt with injuries and things of that nature. But he he was a bigger star in the world of wrestling when he was in WWE. He was in NXT as the leader of the Undisputed Era. The next one, the New Day. Shout out to the New Day. I love a black faction. Um, and they did it a different way, right? Sometimes, like when they first started, the crowd hated them just because they were trying to be forced baby baby faces. And then they turned and became heels, but became a very like, you know, like a heel that's like funny, like you you can't help but like. And that's what got them over. They became heels and that's when they got over. And so um, shout outs in the new day. They've been some of the greatest tag team champions of all time. They've held the titles for a long time. They've done the, the free birds rule where um, there's three members, but each like any random group of the two of the members can represent them as a tag team. I didn't explain that very well, but like, so there's three members of the, of the uh, faction, but let's say member a and member C wants to be, wants to represent the tag team champions. Okay. They can do that. Then the next, <clears throat> the next match member a and member B can then go defend the, in the next match, defend their tag team titles. Uh, so that's what they call the free bird rule. Going back to the free birds, in the early, I want to say 70s, I want to say 70s, 80s. Uh, they had a long run, but um, <clears throat> shout out to the New Day. Another faction, honorable mention, Ministry of Darkness. I will say the Ministry of Darkness had me scared as a kid. Like legit, they was hanging people. They literally hung Big Boss Man off a cage, right? Like they crucified Stephanie McMahon. They crucified um, Stone Cold. They were setting dudes on fire. They was doing all kinds of stuff, right? It was crazy. Um, that was a different time. That was the Attitude Era 
turned up all the way. And the great thing, I think the super, I think the Ministry of Darkness is super underrated because if you like go through their roster, bro, Hall of Famers galore. You got APA, you got obviously Undertaker, you got Big Boss Man, you got um, the uh, the Brood with Edge and Christian. Um, you got so many different wrestlers in the Ministry of Darkness. They're really good. Uh, I think Tess was in uh, like. They were just grabbing dudes. And so Ministry of Darkness was was wild. They were scary as hell. And, um, yeah, I just think they're really underrated. Shout out to them. Obviously, I've kind of talked about the evolution before, but I think they really brought back uh, – speak about Four Horsemen. I think, honestly, that's what Triple H and Ric Flair kind of – obviously, with Ric Flair being there, he kind of show them, okay, this is what we did with the Four Horsemen originally – now this is evolution is going to be a little different, but we can kind of bring those vibes a little bit. And if you if you listen to their theme music, evolution has a very like uh, their theme music is seems very inspired by the Four Horsemen's theme music, and they wore suits and things of that nature. That's very classic Four Horsemen stuff. So um, again, I don't think this is Triple H's like heyday as a wrestler, but I thought he did a really good job of making Batista and uh, Randy Orton look good to the where they could then go off and do their own things and have a Hall of Fame careers. Next, I got to mention the Hart Foundation. I'm not a Bret Hart fan. I know it's blasphemy for some folks. I think he's like watching paint dry, uh, is what, like watching a Bret Hart match, but whatever. I think Bret Hart, if he wrestled today, would not be that great, if I'm being honest. Like back in the day, he would hit a nice suplex and they'd be like, oh, my God, the technical ability of Brit Hart. I'm just like, okay, well, he's a nice suplex. Like, he ain't out wrestling Eddie Guerrero. He ain't out wrestling Daniel Bryan. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't think he'd be that great. Um, I just think during that time, there wasn't that many great technical wrestlers. You had the Hulk Hogan's. You had the, you know, big muscly guys, but they weren't putting on great matches. But, like, I, I don't think he's better than Macho Man by any means. So I got to give Heart Foundation. I didn't mean to shit on the Heart Foundation as mentioned them meant by, you know, mention them on this list, but that's just my thoughts on Britt Hart, the leader Heart Foundation. I respect him though. Really cool. Um, it's like a legit family um, faction, which is always cool. So shout out to the Heart Foundation. Got to mention them. Next on honorable mention list, the shield Roman Reigns, um, Dean Ambrose, and of course, Roman Reigns. I mean, if you're talking about like star power, the shield is up there, right? Like Roman Reigns, I talked about as the GOAT. Seth Rollins may go down as the greatest wrestler of all time. Like when it's all said and done, we'll see. Um, and then Dean Ambrose has had a good career over in AEW. I'm not a fan of Dean Ambrose uh, at all, to be honest. But I get for those that are, I understand his accomplishments. So, and what they did in WWE alone, outstanding, right? They came in and they they sh hit like wildfire. Like people loved it just because they came in. It was just different, right? Dudes coming from the crowd in like army suit, not army, but like tactical gear and like beating the hell out of people and putting them through tables. We loved it. You know, we loved it. And, uh, and I would suggest for those who haven't seen it, like if you want to watch a if you want to understand the Shield and see how over they were and see how good they were, go watch the Shield versus Evolution. Uh, I forgot what pay per view that was on, but that was I watched that match and I was like, okay, I get it, I totally get it. The Evolution came back together to go up against the Shield in, in a uh, three on three uh, match, tag team match, and man, that match was fun. That was that was one of the best like trios match i've seen so go check that one out and then lastly to mention the nation a domination so the nation of domination um amazing crew amazing group of men um i i really i was this was a little bit before my time <clears throat> just a little bit however i remember seeing them and being like yo that's that looks fun like that looks like an important crew that looks like um, a game changer, right? Because we know there wasn't, and there barely is still even today, factions with all black members. 
especially a faction that was talking about black issues that like literally were put together to, you know, confront black issues and things of that nature. So the members were Farouk, obviously was the mem- was the leader. You had Rock, The Rock. Um, you had Mustafa. You had D'Lo Brown. Ahmed Johnson was in there for a bit, garbage. And you had Mark Henry. And again, bro, like Nation of Domination, they were amazing. Now they started adding some some white members at the end, and it got a little got a little fishy there at the end of it. But in their heyday, amazing. And obviously, <laughs> as I mentioned before, like all those guys went on to have great careers. Like Farouk, um, obviously amazing. He had an amazing career before even the Nation of Domination. He was the first black world heavyweight champion in WCW, uh, game changer. But then he went on to be a part of the APA, one of the great tag teams of all time. Then you have Mustafa, who went on to become the godfather um, and, you know, was uh, pimping, you know, doing some wild shit. <laughs> like, wouldn't be acceptable today. He had some hoes and all this other thing, and it was wild. But, you know, it was a cool little good time during that time. D'Lo Brown, heavily underrated, heavily underrated. Uh, with the head head shaking and the and the music and the um and the and I, he was an amazing wrestler, uh, really fun. Uh, Mark Henry, as we all know, Mark Henry went on to have a really good career, um, and had a really good run with the title belt uh, in the early two thousands. And then, obviously, The Rock. You know, I only had to mention what he ended ended up doing. So, a really good group, Nation of Domination, uh, really good. People have been clamoring for a Nation of Domination like reboot, and I would say no thanks. I don't. I, I want them. This is what I want. <clears throat> I want a black faction that is not sort of like the New Day, but a little more. I want more serious version of that. Like I want. Why can't we have a black faction where their goal is to win everything? Why does their goal have to be everything outside of winning championships? Every other, every group I mentioned, NWO, Four Horsemen, The Bullet Club, DX, uh, Undisputed Era, uh, Evolution, Heart Foundation, The Shield, all of those groups' main objective was to win and dominate uh, WWE or their respective um, um, organizations. But for some reason, we can't get that with a black uh, faction, right? Like we are, the black factions have to be trying to address social issues or being trying to make people laugh. But why can't we have a black faction where, and honestly, why can't we just have a black wrestler where their main goal is to win belts? That's all they should care about. That's all I care about. When, if I was a wrestler, that's all I w- my objective would be, was to win championships. That's it, right? That's the only reason I would show up. So my goal is that we can get to a point to where there's a, a Black-led, Black-owned faction whose goal and objective is to win and to do anything that it takes to win and not these other things, right? I feel like so many times they they ask these Black wrestlers to do all this other silly shit but they don't ever say, hey, just go out there and say what you want to do. Go out there to win. And I think these black wrestlers want to win. It's just we all know Vince McMahon and, and things that, like he was on some other shit, like crime time. Like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? I think we had it a little bit there with the Hurt Business. I really do. I thought that was a fun and they were super uh, over, super beloved during the pandemic era because it was black wrestlers trying to win. That's their only objective. They looked nice. They was wearing suits. They was, it was the antithesis of what we saw previously, but obviously we haven't had the hurt business around in years. So I just, I would just ask of any wrestling organization, put together a black owned faction that it, and let them be who they are, but don't push this whole, you know, with, we had a, was it fucking oh hit row like that's what i'm talking about like th- them 
Like, them niggas did not want to win. Them niggas just wanted to rap. Why Why the fuck did we have to rap? Like, I, I, I'm i getting pissed. I'm sorry. But it just annoys me that all these other added elements have to be in a black, a black talent act, but a white group can come out there and say, we just want to win belts and we'll do anything to do it. And everybody's like, okay, that's, okay, cool. Like, we're good. And that's, honestly, that's the way it should be. But we got Hit Row. We got all these other groups. It's like, no. I just want a black faction who wants to win. And that's their main objective. Okay. That was my that was my spiel for the day. So thank thank you for checking us out. Again, we hit our uh our matches of the week. Oh, I almost ma- forgot our matches of the week. My bad, my bad. So quickly, matches of the week. Damian Priest versus Matt Riddle smacked, bro. Really good match. I was on this previous, it was on the uh, June 12th, uh, yesterday's episode of this latest Monday's episode of Raw. Really good match. Probably the best uh, Money in the Bank qualifier match we've had. Like, Damian and Matt Riddle have fought. They've they've had matches going back to NXT. So their their chemistry is, they've I can, they probably have had hundreds of matches against each other. So this match they've probably done a thousand times. But it just it just was really good. Those two have great chemistry. Both are really elite in the ring. So really good match. Next one was underrated. Santos Escobar versus uh, Mustafa Ali uh, in the latest episode of SmackDown on this latest Friday, this past Friday. That was a fun one. Uh, really showed off both the guys' talents. I think Santos is really underrated because to me, Santos, and, and I, I think he should lean into – his style is very more Eddie Guerrero than so he's from a lineage of luchadors. He, he's very like accepting of that, very like uh, shows appreciation towards that. But he's a bigger cruiserweight. He's sort of like Eddie again. So he can do some very agile things, but he's also more power uh, based in a lot of his moves and more technical. And so to see Santos be able to show that off against a guy like Mustafa, who, who's really like agile, can do a lot of the cruiserweight type stuff. It was a really fun match to see. Really good one. And then uh, lastly, we have Orange Cassidy, freshly squeezed uh, versus Swerve Strickland and AEW. Like, again, both of those guys are amazing. They have great chemistry. Orange Cassidy is one of my favorite wrestlers out there. Uh, I hear people hating on Orange Cassidy. They don't like his character and whatnot. I'm like, dude. The character is hilarious. And then the dude has defended his title for like 23, like he's a he's like on a 24-0 uh, title defense streak. Like he's won all of them. And I just think he's proven he's an amazing character. He's proven he's funny. He's proven that he can get over with the crowd. But he's also proven he can be a workhorse and a work rate champion who will face anybody, no matter the talent level, and make a really good match. So Orange Cassidy versus Swerve Strickland, really good. I hope that rivalry continues. And, uh, and yeah, it's a really, really good match. So those are our matches of the week. Again, I appreciate you checking us out. Another episode of Wrestling Worldwide. Willis, hit us up on all the socials. Um, let me know if you agree on, on my factions, my top five factions. Uh, I'm definitely interested to see what people think. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to have dialogue about it. Uh, I want all the smoke. Hit me up. So I appreciate you, and we out.